Hello, hello. This is Greg Brown from Foundry, and today we have the final Moto live stream of 2023. Uh, got a, a great presentation from Matt Pinkwin to share with you, but a few things to go over with first because this is the final live stream, and we have uh, lots of uh, stuff to share with you guys that is important for 2024 and Moto 17.0. So to share that information, uh, Mike, uh, do you want to kind of go through the news and announcements for us? Sure. Yeah, just let everyone know ahead is up that we've decided to uh, roll the proposed 16.1 v9 fixes into 17 uh, in order to keep the team focused on a single release. Um, we had originally, I think Greg had announced that we had a v9 in the works, but uh, like I said, that'll be rolled into 17. And so 16.1 v8, uh, which is out now, is the last 16.1 release. Um, we think this is very public alpha. Yeah. Oh, sorry. yeah, sorry. sorry public yeah, alpha yeah. three. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> you you go for it, man. We're good. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, Public Alpha 3 uh, was just released earlier today for 17. So if you haven't grabbed that or you're not, haven't yet tested, um, grab that and give it a test. Anyone with a, a current license can run the Public Alpha. Uh, things are getting much cleaner. We're getting really close to beta. Uh, the next release will be our first beta and it'll probably be next week. So we need lots of testing from users over the holidays. So if you can grab it and you have time, you know, we need a little break from the family over the holidays, go and play, play with Moto. Um, we just really want people to put Moto through the paces, the things that you rely on and that you do that might be specific to the way you work that, you know, we, we can't test everything in QA. There's a lot of different ways to use Moto. So if, if you find problems with the way you use it, let us know. And if it's a blocking issue, we'll definitely get it fixed as quickly as you can. Um, also, uh, Greg will show you here. Uh, we've got the Foundry showreel, a new showreel. If you if you take a, a watch through that, um, you'll see a, some some moto spottings at about seven, I don't know, 16, 17 seconds, or 14 seconds, I think. There's a couple things in there from the Quadrat Collective and from Cristobal Villa, uh, known as Ateria to many here. Yeah, it's a bunch of great scripts and so forth. But there's some nice ones there. Grab we'll have the link in the show notes that you can grab. There's there's Cristobal's, some of his amazing work in Moto. Um, and then also take a look and watch the brilliant Moto artist at work, Jan Gumont. He's doing a spaceship modeling time lapse. Uh, Jan's worked at, you know, Grade A studios around making visuals for movies you've all seen. You can see how he works and what he does and, and the attention to detail that he puts into a model. Um, he's got a multi-part 30, 31 parts so far, I think series here playlist of of his uh spaceship model and it's really cool so take a look at that um also follow along with chemo hellstrom uh who's one of our alpha testers also has been doing live stream recordings of some organic modeling he's been doing using procedurals and other moto tricks uh his channel in general has a lot of great stuff on it you'll, you'll definitely learn something if you watch his videos um so jump in there and last but not least, uh, the Moto Japan group is holding a big uh, year-end contest uh, award show, I guess you'd say, for their, their, their a special live event where they're doing a character modeling webinar and then a character head contest award ceremony. So that's on December 21st, next Thursday. Definitely take a look at that. Um, I think since it's streamed live on YouTube, they have it, they usually get it set up so that you can get a translation in at least English for that um, if you don't know Japanese. So uh, with all that, back to you, Greg. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much so much for the uh, the updates, Mike. Uh, again, uh, those time lapse uh, videos have been produced by Jan and uh, and Kimo. They're fantastic. And uh, as far as modeling is concerned, it's one of the like I'm really passionate about the the the. Uh, the 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 time lapse that Jan has done because he's really showing what it takes to produce 
a very high integrity model and he's not trimming any of it out. He's not pretending it can be done in 30 minutes. He's showing you what it really takes. So great material to learn, you know, what, what, what skills do a, uh, a modeler need to produce content that is of the quality of ILM and DNEG and all these, you know, larger studios. Right. And all right, next oh, and, up. And yeah, say, if you want to get a feeling for what his models are like um, in alpha right now, and when we release Moto 17, there are a couple models that Jan's done uh, when we call the War Jeep and the Mosquito, both brilliant models. Oh, actually, there's more. He's and also got a, yeah. an AC Cobra in there. So grab those models. You can see what the end result looks like in Moto yourself, not just watching it. It's great models that he's produced. And, uh, and those models will be included uh, with 17.0 when it ships, uh, hopefully with some texturing applied. So with that, we uh, we got a nice presentation up for you guys from Matt Pinkwin uh, talking about proceduralism in Modo and how he's gone from being a direct modeler to a procedural modeler. Uh, about an hour long, uh, good content from him. And so let's go ahead and hop right in there and see what Matt has to say. And we'll catch up with you afterwards. Thanks, guys. All right, and now we are uh, on to our interview with Matt Pinkwin, who is kind enough to join us. Thanks for uh, coming on to to speak about your work, work, Matt. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is an honor. Cheers. No, actually, Matt and I just found out uh, this week that we both went to the same Boy Scout camp as teenagers in uh, in Rhode Island, which was you know one of those bizarre like what a small world we actually live in, huh? Yeah, yeah. No, that's. Um... It brings back a lot of memories. Yeah, Camp Camp Yagu, which almost sounds like a stereotype of a camp name, you know. But but uh, yeah, fond memories of childhood. Funny to funny to hear that we have this this connection from uh, not too long ago, right? It was it was very recently. It wasn't twenty plus years ago. But anyway, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> but cheers. But Matt has a a great presentation for us on how he has uh, uh, started using procedural modeling in his workflows and how that's benefited him. So, all right, let's go ahead and uh, dive right uh, into this. But first off, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, how did you start using Moto? How did you become a three D artist? So I, I got into 3D in the late 90s, uh, going to college, um, thought I was going to study filmmaking and saw a box for Bryce 3D on the shelf at CompUSA, um, which is a great touchstone for being able to date something that's a particular era. Um, but I saw a box for Bryce 3D that said, create your own worlds. And I was like, oh my God, this should be so useful for filmmaking. Um, and it was sort of all downhill from there. Um, I got into Moto around 2007. I was taking classes at uh, RISD Continuing Ed in Maya. And um, Brian Mullen, screen name Giles, if you see him on ArtStation or on Slack, he was teaching that class. And he, the last class, he showed off ZBrush and Moto. And I was in the market for something that could step my game up and at the time Moto 1 eventually got into ZBrush but um, there was just something about Moto at the time that was a little bit more appealing so that's uh, that's how I got introduced to Moto um, and it's been a good portion of the last 10 years in architectural visualization and kind of having Moto, Moto as a trusty sidekick Cheers. Awesome. All right. And uh, moving on with the, the presentation. Uh, so what are we looking at here? It looks like a, a gorgeous uh, amphitheater. Yeah. So I had an interview recently um, with a professional audio company that does theaters and performance spaces and stuff. And they wanted to do a, uh, a, a working test to make sure I had some technical capabilities and it was sort of a mystery of like, all right, what are we going to do? I know we're going to talk about After Effects and Unreal. And I'm like, all right, what can I do for this? And I had all these um, procedural tools that I've been developing over the last year. And I just said, I want to put it to the test. I was actually looking at stage lighting for productions and then realized the theater space, um, at least in this case, would be a much more engaging thing. So... Um, it took me about a day and whipped up a, a kind of an interesting theater. Cheers. In, in Moto and rendered it in Unreal. There you go. And so what 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 did you use to produce this imaging? It's Moto, it's Unreal, anything else? 
Uh, a little bit of substance painter, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a little substance designers for the materials. But that's about it. Yeah, yeah it was know. a very bare bones. Um, a little you know, ZBrush for the props. A little ZBrush for the props. Those came afterwards because um, I was playing around and I thought that might actually be a cool thing to do. Um, the chairs were from a manufacturer that just remodeled them and UV them in Moto. That was probably the most time consuming thing for me, to be honest. Um, but it was worth it because you get really, they occupy enough of the image that they should be the higher quality. Um, and then just sort of kept looking at Pinterest boards of theater lighting and um, panel work. And I thought it was kind of cool. They liked it. Eyes got wide. Jaws dropped. It was a fantastic thing to bring to an interview. And then eventually I rolled back and condensed it all down to a single assembly. So if I ever want to make more theaters, um, it'll be a con convenient setup. And that, that's a really important point that I, I think throughout this presentation, you really hammer home, which is procedural modeling isn't something you do while you're like, I need to knock something out really fast. It's something that you prepare and then you get to leverage over and over and over again. Yeah, I think th this case was an exception. I probably shouldn't have done this by all, by all standards, but I looked at it and I said, I already have these tools. I had half of the tools prepared. The walls are basically brick walls, but exaggerated proportions to make it look like acoustic paneling. Uh -huh. um, this, you know, the stairs were already stairs. They're just exaggerated to look like theater seating. Um, and that was really, that was really the bulk of it. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's, let's take a look at your, uh, your, your, your time-lapse video here of how you're, you're putting this scene together. So yeah, the, the whole rig really runs off of a single curve and the curve to particle generator. And so just however you distort the curve and some fall offs um, for a little bit of just distortion at the back. But that really, it, whatever width of a chair that you put in there. So if I wanted to swap that out for a different seat type, it mm -hmm. should update automatically. And you can see how it played with the aisles, play with the widths. Um, some of the seating angles, being able to aim things at the stage and adding in a um, balcony. Mm -hmm. One of the questions in a previous, when I had showed this the first time, was how long it would take to update the scene given that it was procedural. And I was confident that it would take me no time at all. Um, but this effort almost took me just as long as the first one. Um, <laughs> But it's an extensive edit, to be honest, and mm -hmm. all the stuff is already there. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, you know, it raised the ceiling, which raised the roll walls, which affected the lighting. I think I put some more effort into UVs. Um, but having the the assembly now, as it's um, packaged, would make any future effort so much more efficient. Mm -hmm. Now it's fantastic work. And it's, it's exactly one of these situations where, uh, you know, in my past working with art directors, uh, the, the value of this, uh, as far as being able to, you know, tweak and tune in front of them or and accommodate their changes, as opposed to them coming and saying, I, I just want to move these chairs over and it taking, you know, a week of work to do that. Like that's where yeah. the upfront cost of procedural modeling really becomes valuable. Like you have happy customers, you have happy people, uh, that you're, you're working with who are directing you. Yeah. Yeah, half of it is making half of it is making an artist friendly tool and mm -hmm. the other half of it is an art director friendly tool there you go bingo <laughs> like and that's actually it's one of the really it really is one of the strengths that I, I found using moto in production was it was like just the way that moto works the way that moto's workflows um are engineered is that they are very directable and yeah, yeah. procedural modeling has only extended that further all right so let's let's hop on over here to um our next video and uh, or actually hop on over here to the, the final resulting image. And so this was uh, entirely, uh, I mean, where was it rendered? You said you used Unreal. Is this, is this actually truly real time? Yeah, this is all Unreal. Um, probably should have recorded a video, but um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, this is straight screen grab straight out of Unreal. It's gorgeous. It really it is. Worked. Real simple materials, real simple lighting um, and did not, require you know too much too, too much effort and uh, no problem with the geometric complexity um, not yeah no problems at all fantastic all right 
Okay, so let's hop on over here. So um, you also were using Modo with augmented reality. Where did where did that come from? What, what what's this all about? So uh, uh, when I was a modeler for Studio AMD, which was a an architectural visualization studio in Providence, uh, we had a, we had an app that was sort of a package of materials. Um, it was called our building. So if you had to do a presentation about whatever it was you were developing, there was still images, videos, PDFs, and it was an also an early, and I say early, it was like 2015-ish um, adoption of augmented reality um, using Unity and Vuforia. Um, I was able to, they had some issues with the modeling pipeline because it was still new to as they were developing it, um, but being able to use Moto, take a 40 million polygon Revit file and reduce it down to 40,000 polys and two or three textures so it runs on an iPhone. Um, yeah, that was a good effort. And, and they made really, really interesting augmented reality pieces. Cheers. And, but I mean, like what was like, you started, you started using AR at a relatively early time uh, for it, but um, what did you find the value of it was, especially with interacting with clients or people who are directing you? The, the advantage for augmented reality is that it's a shared experience. Mm -hmm. um, you're not putting goggles on your face. There's nothing obstructing your view. You can still have eye contact with people around the room if there's something going on. Um, so on that level, it's a shared experience. It's completely different than VR. Um, on a pure novelty level, being able to point your phone at a surface and see a model pop up still is like mm -hmm. a little burst of dopamine. It's still fun. Um, one of the really cool examples here, especially with the red building, they didn't have a design. There was gonna be a project, there was something was gonna happen there, they didn't know what it was gonna be, so how do we make this engaging? And it was just, you know, leave it as a leave it as a colored mass um, and model the site around it so people can still see the context and it, uh, it was pretty effective. So yeah, reduction in the amount of hand waving you have to do when you're trying to say it's gonna kinda of look like this and it's gonna kinda of be over here. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of value yeah. there to that. Okay, great. And uh, what's this about, dailies and social media dopamine? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm a big proponent of daily practice, even though I don't always stick to it every time that I have, you know, for a, just, you know, using ZBrush every day for a month or any of that kind of effort, like Inktober um, that just happened. There was a period around 2016, 2017 when I was doing all the architectural visualization stuff, as you can see, it might have been a little stale. Um, so I would go home at night and still model things and play around in Moto and still uh, and render in Octane. Um, and this was one of the early days of uh, Mega Scan. So being able to you know model my own Moss cards and scatter them with replicators to make some pretty convincing Moss mm -hmm. was a lot of fun. But at that daily practice of going through a thing and it starts to get the gears turning about how do I automate some of these steps? Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. All right. And uh, kit bashing. Um, I'm surprised you didn't just twitch when I said that. Uh, but explain explain your experience here with kit bashing. I thought it was a great story. So, so yeah, this was the thing that really set me off on the uh, procedural modeling thing. Um, this was from the early days of kit bash within like the first six months. And there wasn't supposed, there still hadn't been textures included when we were doing this. And the ask, it was really cool. Um, on the one hand, 36 buildings in six weeks, mm -hmm. but also some flexibility because in the circle of, you know, 3D artists, visual effects artists, and modelers, um, freelance work comes up. And to be able to have some flexibility of, you know, oh, you need to go do your thing and come back to the get bash at school. Um, so there was some flexibility in the schedule. My schedule exploded. I was doing work for Star Wars stuff and um, like a bunch of other clients I just couldn't turn down. Um, but the pace of being able to do 36 buildings in six weeks was a monumental task and really set me on the path of if I'm gonna do this ever again or at any scale, there needs to be some modular procedural approach um, to, des to designing and creating these things and see what we can do with it to take it even a step further because there was a lot of room for like interior work. There's no interiors on these. Um, 
but that's something that I'm really interested in being able to do, have like a holistic, immersive environment procedurally. Yeah. Instead of, instead of just bespoke creating, you know, one of 35 buildings, build a system that can randomize and create buildings the way that buildings really are created in the real world. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now then this is gorgeous work, but man, the, thank you. 36 days is what you said. One, one per day. Yeah. 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 No, it's a huge effort. And I, and I understand if you make, you know, your modular windows and your modular doors and there's approaches that you can take to it, but it, to a certain extent, it was, it was a huge lift. Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, are you finding that the expectations of what artists should be able to produce is rising and maybe that's a consequence of more proceduralism and better workflows? I think so. Yeah. No, the bar rises. I mean, you will see in some other mm -hmm. slides, like one, the bar is risen. Um, things are so convenient. The pace of work that we might've been used to, cause I started into this like in the late nineties, two thousands mm -hmm. and to see how fast a turnaround time mm -hmm. people can do now, especially when they're kit bashing other things like, um, it might also just be me getting, I don't know, I'm, um, not as youthful as I was <laughs> <laughs> being with the late nights and, you know, bleeding eye deadline thing is less appealing. Um, it helps to work smarter and not harder. Cheers. Exactly. And that's, that's funny that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's our goal with what we want to accomplish in Moto is enable you guys to work smarter and not harder. And so you know, the first step of that is performance for the 17 series. More on that later. All right. So, uh, and what are we looking at here? A bunch of example images. I love yeah, so the shanty town. Thank you. Uh, shanty. Um, yeah. So this was my response to that kid bash effort of the months later, um, just grinding away on, early iterations of procedural models like you see in the mm -hmm. top right that's a that's an unreal render mm -hmm. um, with some just interesting atmosphere i think the other guys are octane renders um but you can see with the the concrete towers starting to put together some pieces and see what works and see what doesn't there was a lot there was a lot of trial and error um probably more error along the way than anything else but where, where it's at now i'm feeling pretty comfortable so Gorgeous. And yeah, uh, we're, uh, for those of you who watch these streams and, uh, the live stream from, uh, over the summer, um, you know, we're working on a project with some of our alpha testers. We got to get Matt to help out with that because that image of the shanty town is perfectly aligned with what we're working on. So, uh, looking forward to playing around with those scenes with you, Matt, this is great. And a lot of, a lot of draped cloths, uh, I guess you used uh, marvelous for that. Correct. Oh yeah. Marvelous designer. I love Mar yeah, marvelous. Marvelous is great. Yeah. It is a lot of fun. All right, and what do we have here? A bunch of more kind of formal architectural uh, examples, I, I think. Yeah, um, so this was the architecture stuff um, I've been doing over the last five years, working in corporate architecture in Boston. Um, we had a large K-12 department. Um, that's a high school in Massachusetts in the top right. Um, I ended up getting a drone and a drone license and doing photogrammetry scans and integrating synthize in. These are all really Max and V-Ray. That was sort of the day job uh, platform to do these, but still going home at night. Or every time I would open up Revit and start doing Revit tutorials and thinking, wow, that's interesting. I, have, I think I can do this in Moto procedurally. Or mm -hmm. <laughs> like how many, how many things I can use in other programs that I always think back like, oh, I can make this in Moto. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that Greg Lundberg constantly emphasizes. You know, he's like, there's a lot of great procedural tools out there. You know, they all have their own advantages versus other tools. And a lot of people just aren't aware about how far you can go in Modo with uh, procedural modeling. And that's something that's very high on my list of priorities for us to pursue to enable for you guys. And uh, okay, I think you got a lot of explaining here to do. Uh, Palladio proportions. Let's Let's hear more yeah. about this. All right, so um, so I'm not an architect. Uh, I took a few classes in interior design, and one of them went over this history of design. And um, Palladio was a, an architect. Um, I forget which century off the top of my head. But what those guys would do would, would be to go to Rome and measure the ruins and find what they were using as a measure of proportion um, for everything else. So this really boils down to the radius of the base of the column. Everything is proportional to the radius or the diameter of the base of the column. 
Hmm. Every every little groove, every little nook and cranny is based around that one little proportion. Um, so I went through, and I always thought that was a, like a worthwhile exercise to someday do um, procedurally, just to see what it would, what the outcome would be. Um, so kit the, kit bashing and modularity was invented by the Greeks and the Romans, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. All right, let's take a look uh, what you what you have next over here. All right, so classical proportions, and this is you building this column according to those guidelines. Yeah, so that one measurement, the diameter of the column, as you can see, branches out into every other facet of that one piece. Mm -hmm. So however that diameter gets changed, the only thing that should change as that um, after a certain height, the diminution or the tapering of the column mm -hmm. um, becomes a little bit less, but that's, there's a logic note for that. Cheers. But this is a great exercise, and it's one of those like design things. If you do it enough, I mean, yeah, the next slide is perfect. Got it. So, what is this? This is really uh, this is an interesting concept because reliable measurements is a fairly new thing in human history. So, what is this? So, this is a daisy wheel. This is what um, master builders would carve into beams in colonial or medieval buildings. Um, so, all of their uh, you know, journeymen, carpenters, and everybody would be working off of the same unit of measure um, and just use that the different proportions of that one daisy wheel. So if you go climbing around in old attics around New England, you'll see one of these carved into a beam somewhere. Um, and I also thought that was a pretty cool thing to use uh, for some of the um, procedural modeling to be able to just keep working off of that idea of proportion you have a mm -hmm. measurement of one thing that drives something else exactly and it, like i you know i i had no idea about this i i had watched an interesting documentary on how european castles were built and how every castle had its own base unit of measure so somebody would establish here is what we're measuring from and everything would be built off that so every castle is a little bit different you know but i wouldn't have looked at this shape and thought that's something to define measurements and scale for what's being created. And actually, I wonder how many times this has been seen in an old building and thinking it has kind of spiritual, you know, relevance, because that's what I would assume at first. But no, this is this is actually science. This is, you know, base measurements for constructing a building. Yeah. Very cool. All right. And uh, procedural joinery. This is when it starts getting a little hairy, right? Yeah, so this is kind of based off of the same principle and just using the radius of a circle to define how wide a barn or a house should be with a hipped roof like that. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of objects for overrides. I was going through a phase of building way too much stuff with locators is really what this boils down to. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I would do this the same way again, um, but the, the joints um, where they're just sort of overlapping, that's kind of a challenge that's hanging over my head of being able to procedurally make the the joints and the joinery properly. Cheers. Um, like, why would I even do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, Is anyone going to appreciate be, that? <laughs> no, but there's nothing wrong. You did it because you care. <laughs> no, it, it matters yeah. to me. Exactly. I think that's an important aspect of being, you know, satisfied as an artist. All right. And so, and this is kind of an extrapolation of that. Yeah, I mean, it's a single, similar thing, like, all right, how would I make a daisy wheel in moto and be able to use that to drive the proportions of other things? And I it just wound up going down more like Islamic architecture and patterning and stuff. Yeah, cool. Um, but it's a, it's a neat, fun, complex shape. Very, 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 very. So what, what, what is CS50? And what's, we have CS50 and Mario and Stairs. <laughs> Yeah, so CS50 is the most popular course at Harvard. It's their computer science course, and it's free on edX. And it has a huge audience. Um, and I've tried to sit through it for a number of years, get busy, get tired, get distracted, whatever. Um, even when I was working in architecture, our firm tried to take it. There was about 24 of us that started. It, that dwindled down to 12, that dwindled down to three. And then finally, we all sort of gave up and wandered off. And I don't think anybody, one of us finished one of the assignments. Mm -hmm. um, but it, earlier this year, um, I really dug into it and did a lot of Python work 
and their second assignment is the Mario assignment, where you input a number and it creates that number of bricks with hashtags or asterisks or whatever you put in. Um, and I finally just snapped and figured out how to do it, just sat down and had a, a moment and um, had a huge burst of confidence, like, oh my God, we can actually do this now. How would I make these stairs in Moda? Like the, if I, if I'm going to do houses and buildings and interiors, like stairs are going to be kind of important. I, I love that you just you, you 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 sketched out this idea like on the computer it looks like but still like handwritten axis slice and clone you're 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 planning out your mesh shops on it is essentially on paper yeah that's um i would advise anybody to do that just don't if you have to think of it on paper it totally helps mm -hmm. um because it's different than like all right here's my python thing that mm -hmm. creates however a thing is going to be duplicated this is different. It's just translating it into a different method. Um, and this one, like I said, I went through a phase of locators. This, I, I think I did this one right. Um, but it really just creates one step and it uses the, the actual input of the rise and the run or however an architect or a builder would be describing stairs. Got it. Um, so it's all like real and proportional. Very cool. All right. And so uh, I, I guess this applies to other talented artists that level proceduralism? Yeah. So um, Alex Shimakov um, does amazing moto assemblies. And every time I would sit down to do one, and I couldn't, um, in, in the process of trying to figure it out, that small little voice in the back of my head, was always reminding me like, no, he actually does this. The software is not broken. You're just not using it right. Figure it out. Um, and uh, Alec, uh, no, no, uh, Anthony Hopkins, um, if you've ever seen The Edge with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin, they're in the woods being pursued by a bear and Anthony Hopkins is getting them psyched up in one scene and he says, what one man can do, another can do. And I just kept looking at Alex's assemblies. I'm like, no, you can figure this out. Um, and then Vasily Koryagin on the left, uh, I stumbled across his work on the Unreal Marketplace and looking at his brickwork and how he's using geometry, it was very validating to know this is what we're doing in Unreal now. This is what real time has become. It's a different level of geometry. It's a different use of geometry. Um, so like I'm on the right path. That was just sort of like good motivation. Cheers. And, and Alex is a super smart guy. He makes incredibly clever things. But uh, I do like this notion of somebody else did it. I can too. And on top of that, Alex sells his assemblies and you can go ahead and just buy them and download them and, you know, tear them apart. And it's amazing how much you can learn by doing that. I think a lot of people are intimidated by procedural modeling and they're surprised how quickly they can make it part of their daily work and then how quickly they also get good at it. Yeah. All righty. Cool. If it bleeds, we can kill it. What, 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 what's this all about? Yeah. So the, the stairs thing was the, well, that was the watershed moment. Like mm -hmm. if I could figure out stairs and to the extent that we, that I did make the stair assembly, um, all of a sudden everything else, all the possibilities of we're off for the races. If it like boil it down to an assembly, if you can drag and drop it from the presets, save it out, do all these things like, okay, now we can do the rest of it. It was Got just it. one of those was if it bleeds, we can kill it moment. I love the confidence. <laughs> All right. And so now we're getting into the meat of uh, actual creation here. And so I see archways and stairs and lots of lots of technical looking things. Yeah. Anybody who spends any amount of time on the Slack channel um, is probably seeing these already because that's um, that's always rewarding to share work and get people's feedback. Yeah. So this was really, you know, going from the top left. Um, one of the design principles that I really picked up from working with architects was using plan and elevation to design a form. Um, so this is just a case of using curves to create plan and elevation and see those intersections. Um, and that's kind of a robust assembly I need to circle back to, but that's, that's really helpful. The, the stone arch thing um, apparently was a big hit. I didn't think much of it at the time, except, oh, I have an idea. If I use curve sweep and split all of the edges 
and bend it, I can start to make these fun stone stacked arches mm -hmm. and um, went down a huge rabbit hole with those in a lot of different ways. But I'm glad I did because they show up in video game environment art all mm -hmm. the time or looking at classical architecture, designing stone mm -hmm. windows and stairs and gateways. Um, stairs, as you can see, I think there's three or four more iterations that have been done since I took that one. Um, yes. Steve Hill's brick. Um, that was another watershed moment for me was going through Steve Hill's um, brick tutorial and then figuring out on my own how to fill in the ends with half size bricks and then bundle it all up um, so that it worked. That was a big moment for me. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, Steve does amazing things. Steve does amazing work. Um, and it was cool having that because it runs off of replicators and then also later building a different brick wall with another method that works um, a little differently. So it's fun to be able to compare the performance of the two solutions. Um, and then the curve to stone generator thing that just got, that's a fun tool. <laughs> Sweet dude. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And so pursuing this allowed you to create these structures now that are less granular, but starting to really move towards the idea of making modular components to build out, you know, an entire, an entire, uh, castle or building or whatever, all the things contribute to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It just accelerates the whole process of, you know, procedural modular environment pieces. Um, these steepled ones over here that like that one drives me nuts because i played around with trying to accomplish this as well and this is where i started having major trouble with these intersecting archways yeah i had to do that one twice Good. Uh, okay well <laughs> i tried more than twice <laughs> and columns more columns yeah more columns yeah and so and then um there you'll see in some of the the videos and you know, time lapses um it's it, I ripped through these in about 10, 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, whatever would have taken me otherwise, I don't know how much time, um, but it's really drag and drop and flexible. How many elements have bricks? How many elements are mm -hmm. made out of stone? Um, yeah, there's a lot of use cases for it. All right. Nice. All right. And so now we're on to uh, your, your stair demo here. And let me go ahead and raise up the resolution of this because Google Slides refuses to just let me set the resolution from scratch. So go ahead. Yeah, so this is this is the stairs. You can see how it rips through. We can do planks, we can do stone, we can do different uh, massings that go with the stairs. There are stringers, mm -hmm. um, different styles of stringers, the underside, the sun side, banisters, um, how, the number of stairs that you want. And it's all based off of the rise and run. Um, you can bend it and it's all set up. You don't really have to do too, too much. That's beautiful. No, I love the curved stairs. And I mean, it's just an example of the type of thing that like, again, from my experience, you have an art director come to you and say, actually, I just want the, the stairway to turn a little bit. And I wanted to have three more steps. And it's like, oh, you just ruined my entire last week of work, <laughs> but yeah. you prepare ahead for it. And, uh, and then, yeah, you're able to actually satisfy your client's needs and not waste your time. Yeah, there's, there's so many things. Like the 2D shapes to floorboards, if you want to make any kind of fort, any kind of shanty thing. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing stones here. There's so many environments. That's so great. Arches. And I saw one of these in real life over the summer, and I got really excited. Somebody had a giant one in their, in their garden. Oh, okay, gotcha. I'm a fan of arches. My house is full of not stone arches, but arches and just weird. But anyway, gorgeous stuff. All right. Oh, and that is, it's just so fun watching you, uh, you interact with them here. Yeah. These are, uh, and then the, yeah, the actual it, wall. it sparks joy. It sparks joy. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm seeing, uh, I, this looks like 16 one V eight. Have you tried, uh, I mean, a, it looks like you're using the curvature shading and the advanced viewport quite a lot. Um, and, uh, have you tried this out in, uh, in 17 at all, or any of these assemblies? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been awesome for the performance testing. I think I filed a few, mm -hmm. filed a few things just to see how I can't, I, I can't imagine how somebody would debug a file like this. Cause they're very dense. Mm-hmm 
schematic graphs. So like what if something is choking a scene, being able to find it. Um, it's very easy for us. So you passing on scenes like this and telling us where the problems are, we can evaluate where the time is yeah. being spent. It's not easy, but it it's part of our job is what we do. And so we have the tools to, to do that. So examples like this are huge, especially examples that show, you know, like, I don't know why this is slowing down. It shouldn't. And, uh, and so we need more of these things from all users out there. Uh, that's so cool. Love that. And what the heck is coining? Coining is the stuff that happens at the corners of ah. buildings or houses. If you ever see them, mm -hmm. they're 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 everywhere. Um, but it's a it's a personal thing. You know, one of one of my it's Studio AMD. I I UV'd one lazily. I guess I don't know. There was it, 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 you need to offset the UVs on every other brick and randomize it better so it can mm -hmm. get hidden. Um, but that was always stuck in my head of like I need to make a procedural coining so. This never happens again. My, I love procedural pathways in Modo. Uh, there, these are so much fun and very easy to do. Yeah, it's it's tough playing video games and seeing elements and thinking, God, I need to go uh -huh. into Modo. I, like every time I pick up a game, you know, I like uh, like I get it, like interested in something I see in the game, and then I'm I'm out of the game and I'm trying to make something again. These pathways are deceptive too. Um, uh, deceptive how how much control you can offer. Yeah, yeah, that's a I can I can that's a it's a good rabbit hole to go down. This walkway thing was very satisfying because mm -hmm. they they show up in so many places. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so great. Absolutely love this. That actually it felt a lot like rigging this one that, uh, th these that's what all this is this is all rigging and that's something that i, I keep on having to, to emphasize is that you know it's like when we talk about rigging we're not just talking about you know moving characters around we're talking about creating systems you know and it is something that moto excels at cool all right and uh i'm gonna have to go ahead and skip over this one again there we go. And so uh, some examples of the archways, the variations, the archways you were able to create really quickly, right? I just love yeah, how I the just... curvature shading makes everything more readable. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, the, I, I ripped through those in like 20 minutes. Those were a lot of fun. Fantastic. And whoa, okay. So this looks pretty practical. Yeah, so uh, again, on a personal level, if uh, if anything starts to jump out, my feed there's a lot of foam modeling that comes across my feed. Mm -hmm. I love this stuff. I was a tabletop Warhammer kid um, and probably should have stuck with it. Um, but I, I have a great admiration for the work that these people do and all the little individual foam bricks that get laid. So these are always in the back of my mind as being cool environment pieces. And, a, and you can see where some of the procedural stuff echoes some of those forms. Mm -hmm. That's really that's really the end goal. If you look at any of those, it's like, all right, this is going to be a procedural thing, like that. Cheers. No, this these these are these are I my mean, they're gorgeous. I, I love looking at these things too. But it's also interesting when you see their their how they work in the real world. How that can also inspire decision making in in how we work in in you know in three D in a virtual virtual world. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Piranesi, Piranesi. How, how how do you pronounce it? Yeah, Piranesi. Piranesi, um, there we go. And, and I could still be wrong. Uh, so my, <laughs> big goal, <laughs> my big goal this year was to do the what I I keep referring to it, keep referring to him as the Piranesi kit, and that was to go through all fifteen of his uh, Carcheri etchings and create a scene for those and sell them on the Unreal Marketplace. Um, but to go through and take every element and make a procedural version of that. Mm -hmm. So all the columns, the arches, you can see like the Ashlar arch and some of the patterns that otherwise I probably wouldn't have tried to do looking at them and having that as a goal. Now that I have them, I realized like their value and I can use them everywhere. Um, but it was good to sort of narrow the focus down on things to work on and what steps to keep moving forward with. 
you know, and it also, it just gives you some confidence because like I, I found when, when you build buildings out of bricks or blocks, it, like you, you immediately want to jitter them. Right. But then you start having self doubt as far as does it really, are, are those offsets way overdone? And when you look at artwork like this from the past, it's like, ah, okay, this is accurate. Yeah. So it kind of gives you some confidence there. Yeah. Cool. All right. And, uh, and then over here, we're kind of looking at uh, a, a little bit of kind of workflow stuff between multiple apps, right? Yeah. So this is really the round trip of taking the procedural. This was a procedural rock generator, right? Mm -hmm. so somebody do something in Blender and I was like, yeah, we can do this in Moto. Mm -hmm. And this uses the vector, uh, vector maps um, with, uh, with the, the combing and grooming tools. Um, to get a base mesh and then sending it over to ZBrush for a little bit of sculpting and then substance painter for the final details. Um, but you can see where all the forms come from and how the, you know, typical asset that you you could just make a thousand of very quickly. Mm -hmm. And just to elaborate on, on what Matt's saying here is he basically used the hair or the fur sculpting tools, not the long hair sculpting, but the fur sculpting tools to be able to tweak how things are, are oriented essentially. And so you can use vertex map vectors to groom fur in Modo, um, but you can, that's just actually generating a vector. So you can use that to guide almost any, anything you want. You can also grow long hair and you can like, you can even do curve sweeps and groom while that geometry is being deformed. So there's a lot of really interesting ways you can use the fur tools, but not for fur. And again, specifically fur, not long hair. All right. And uh, and the Griddler. We're finally, we're on to the Griddler, which the Griddler is the really the master idea that encompasses all this, right? Yeah, this, this pulls the whole thing together. Um, so in the process of making, especially the Piranesi thing, the, the prison bars, the dungeon bars, mm -hmm. um, which are a grid-like thing, and I had had it all set up and I realized what I had made could potentially be used for something like this and just doing um, structural grids for architecture projects, mm -hmm. which I, this is like a modern you know, screenshot probably from Revit or something. Um, but if you look at anything that really gets built, there's going to be a structural grid applied mm -hmm. to it, whether it's linear or radial or something else, offset grids, different grids on different floors. Um, there's all sorts of need and use uses for them. So I went through the process of creating what I've now called the Griddler. Um, this is its current iteration where it just takes a single polygon, slices it up, and produces volumes for every aspect of that grid for respecting the ceiling height. So you get columns, floor slabs, um, the spaces between the floor slabs, ceiling panels, um, and whatever you drop into those gets replicated across. Um, so we get some pretty interesting uh, effects like this. And the idea is that it's, you know, modular procedural, take those volumes, use the procedural tools to create each item, then take those into ZBrush, sculpt them up, detail them, everything, and then bring them back into Moto to be replicated back out again, and then onto Unreal. That's fantastic. No, that, I mean, I mean there's, this there's is... a way of yeah. illustrating that or explaining it better, but that's... The, I think most people who are watching this are, are understanding it. It's, you know, do layout first, basic shapes, sculpt those beautiful shapes. You have yeah. really high quality models, but now, you know, take those high quality, replace the the basic shapes and then then just send it over to Unreal using the Moto Bridge, um, which is really great for for static assets like you're doing here. Um, I do have one request or, or one suggestion that everybody will suggest is I think we need a Moria image without question. Uh, Minds of Moria, because down here, the, the lower right hand corner uh, of the screen, that looks like it's made to be the Minds of Moria from Lord of the Rings, you know, yeah, all beautiful. Right, we'll that <laughs> yeah, it's all, it almost already is. Um, all right, so we have a, another video, but now it's, uh, we're moving on to the walls. Is that correct? Yeah. So this is starting to show off, like when you export one of the volumes from the Griddler and taking, in this case, a procedural wall, the brick wall, um, and using that to fill in mm -hmm. that volume, so you get the different, you know, 
break widths, heights, divisions. Um, there's a little bit of Steve Hill uh, turbulence. Mm -hmm. The Jitter Mesh Shop is my favorite, of course. Um, so yeah, it just creates different proportions. And then you, you'll see, I even use multiple assemblies to create even more variety. Mm -hmm. I have larger bricks at the bottom and uh, at the top. It is so fast. Mm -hmm. And just so straightforward. It's how you should, especially at this stage of creation, how you should be thinking about things. Like it's kind of like what, you know, one of my frustrations in, uh, you know, working with new artists and with sculpting where it's like, why are you sculpting pores? You know, like you haven't, you haven't actually blocked out your shape right yet. And you're, you're sculpting pores and wrinkles. Yeah. That was a big thing uh, that I picked up, especially working with the architects is just massings, mm -hmm. how many massings that we can go through of iterating early design phase stuff. And the idea, if you make something too detailed, people are going to get too attached to it. Mm -hmm. and think it's like what you've committed to. Mm -hmm. So you sort of have to play a careful game of let's impress them, but don't impress them too much. And the like these gray box assemblies kind of occupy a nice halfway space. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Oh, I love this stuff. All right. I think we can move on to the, the next video. And, uh, and so this is taking things a little bit, a little bit further, the, uh, the, the, really the detailing side of creating these modular construction, uh, kind of kit bashing elements, right? Yeah. So this is once we finally settled on the, the brick pattern and exported it to ZBrush mm -hmm. and a little bit of Dynamesh, a little bit of sculpting, masking some of the peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. So we can apply a noise to some of the broader areas. And this whole process and this whole step is really like, yes, you can do a lot. You can spend a lot of time in ZBrush, um, but this is meant to be very quick and very rough just to have something for substance painter cheers to bite to bite onto and you can see where i'm like masking mm -hmm. all that stuff and then and on over to substance yep on over to substance beautiful and you can see where i need to do some homework on baking normals <laughs> 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 yeah, we had a long talk about normal baking uh, <laughs> yesterday where you think it's a simple notion and it is not. And every person who knows a lot about it has very well illustrated to me how little I understand about ba baking normals well. It's an art. It's, it's, a, well, it's a science, the science and an I art. Could, I could quickly become a Mari user after thinking about it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. And um, let's see. Let's move on over to... Uh, the next thing we have up here, which um, now we're on over to, uh, I believe, the, the columns. Yeah, the columns. Um, so in this case, again, bringing the volume over from what the Griddler produced. And there it is adjusting the diameter of the base of the column to get it to match the height of the rest of it. And then just grabbing some of the other ones to see for reference where it would intersect what's going on how Very close cool. it is to the top it is interesting how little time like you're 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 uh your video is overlaid on top of where the item properties are, but I noticed that you very rarely spend any time in the item properties because of how you constructed your assemblies to be accessible through locators. You know, so it's kind of funny. I never see you going down to the lower right hand, you know, corner for the item properties. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, if there's anything consistent about these is I use a locator every single mm -hmm. time to put all the uh, controls on and there's so many other ways of being able to do that that Moto offers. I just keep going back to that one. <laughs> Cheers. All right. And uh, this one's a kind of a long video. Again, skip yeah. on through here. Um, 
but yeah, just finally combining all these things together, right? Like, uh, like, yeah. yeah, developing these, these, these shape, these, uh, nice column shapes. Uh, so you then can integrate them into the Griddler and produce these complex interior environments. Very nice. Okay. And let's go ahead and hop on over to the, the, the collection of it all together, right? So. Get that on over to 1080p. There we go. So there you go. Is this the uh, the combination of of the uh, um, the actual columns and the archways and the and the actual walls? Yeah. So this is bringing in the. The, the procedural frozen objects. Um, so once you once you've established your form or you're, you've established whatever it is, you can bring that in, and the rest of the replicator updates and should put it where it needs to go. Very cool. We can kind of hop on through here so we can start to see some of these results as we move on over. So just more and more refinement. And it just looks like such a gratifying process, like with, you know, um, these assemblies that you're just you're just placing and you're just building out your world uh, to be more and more detailed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Riddler is really the force multiplier on this of just, you know, taking things that are already efficient and taking it a step further. Cheers. All right. Okay. Let's uh, take a look at uh, just your, your kind of overview of the Gridler here. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is the overview. Those are the parts, um, some of the parts that it produces. So you get, you know, columns, room volumes, walls, things hanging from the ceilings. And on the lower left, the, the sculpted and detailed UV mm -hmm. uh, pieces that, went through ZBrush and Substance Painter, come back into Moto, get plugged back in, and then sent over to Unreal on the right there. So you can get a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty compelling environment pretty quickly. And I just love seeing all this stuff populate in. And, you know, this is kind of your experience using the bridge, right? Like, you're like, all right, let's fire this over and... And Unreal is just just pulling everything in for you, and you get to see it populating a lot like you're going to see Moto 17.0 behave, especially as it evolves throughout next year, where we 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 don't make you wait for everything to populate. You can interact while things are coming in. I keep forgetting that it's really cool. Yeah, well, it's 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 <laughs> it's, it's it's not perfect yet. It's much better than it used to be, but it's something that you know we want to have more elements stream in in that way, so you don't you spend less time waiting, right? Yeah. But uh, such a gratifying experience uh, seeing you move around this. So like all these individual things that you already had laid out in Modo, now you're at a state that you're like, actually, I'm going to go ahead and lay it out in Unreal. And you're just able to go in there and use the stuff that's there, duplicate it, you know, and, and get it all into uh, organization to have a really nice, complicated scene, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just dropping the materials in. Everybody mm -hmm. updates. Great. And so that's, uh, you know, working his way through Unreal and laying everything out. And, ah, yeah, those nice dramatic <laughs> ceilings. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. This is this yeah. is excellent. Uh, and just being able to play with lighting that flexibly. So satisfying, you know. Yeah. Real time is the new offline. And uh, just a, a quick image from Unreal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the uh, stone shaders had a default of red. So when I was putting it on everything, they just kept showing up red. And at some point, I was like, well, oh, actually, we're kind of cool. We should try that. Hey, we've got a lot of iron on this planet, don't we? <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, and this just you were touching on uh, on 17.0. And uh, yeah, what, 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 what were your thoughts about 17.0 relating to this work that you're doing? Um, so 17 has been awesome in being able to bring in multiple assemblies and have hear this feedback. There's plenty more for us to improve upon, but hearing those, those real world user using our, our tools and seeing that improvement in, you know, actual production is, is 
exactly what we want to hear. So very exciting hearing, hearing you communicate to the, that to us, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. The, and the advanced viewport is gorgeous. Like what we saw in the first slide in Unreal, this is Moto's mm -hmm. advanced viewport with regular lighting, doing interiors. Um, it looks awesome. There you go. Yeah. And just tossing out a tiny bit of, uh, of depth of field, uh, in the viewport and a few other little things. It's amazing how, how, how much it can plus things up. And again, I, I just love the curvature shading because it lets me read forms better. So you have some thoughts that you wanted to share, uh, with users about diving into procedural modeling and what to expect, right? Yeah. So the, the being good at traditional modeling doesn't mean you'll be good at procedural modeling at first. Um, I like to think I'm a competent and confident modeler traditionally. So jumping into the procedural stuff, it's like, all right, where is it? There's, a, it. there's, a, there's an adjustment period. There's sort of like a dip in expectation. It's a little less fun at first, but after a while and figuring it's things more out, gratifying. Sudden, yeah. You know, it's, it's worth the effort. It becomes yeah, like you feel like as a modeler, you start to feel more like a rigger because that is really what you're you're doing. And it, you know, it, you you don't set it and forget it uh, the way you do with direct modeling. It's like you, these these are things that you get to tune and tweak later, and so it's more information to retain. Retain, but it is so gratifying. Yeah. And uh, next thought. Yeah. So not all procedural software are built the same, and knowing one doesn't mean you know another. Yeah, they're not all, you know, if, if I spend a lot of time in Substance Designer and then switch over to Moto, I will start to try to like, oh, why doesn't it do this thing? And then, mm -hmm. no, it's different. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, I think the analogy I used was don't, if you understand English, that doesn't necessarily mean you know Spanish or Mandarin or Finnish. So adopting a new language isn't necessarily going to be, you're not going to be as proficient, but people still write poetry in all of those languages. So you just got to figure out, you know, syntax. I love that metaphor. I think that's great. Um, and uh, all right, what, what do we got here? Yeah, don't do it on a deadline. <laughs> it's, it's a pre-production thing. It's time consuming. The amount of time where I will sit and stare and wait to figure something out and then magically figure it out. Um, you can't really do that if there's <laughs> if there's a deadline looming so yeah if um you know get it done early get it done um so that when the deadlines do show up and you do have them um that theater thing being the exception i also find that this is a, a very easy notion to sell to clients that it's like okay so we're going to do more work up front so that you're able to change more later and, and you contextualize it that way you can organize a project to allow for that initial creation portion that is much heavier than just direct modeling but man the interaction with any client is so much better uh, when you have that flexibility absolutely yeah. Cheers. All right. And, um, all right. A lot like coding, huh? Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know how it works. It just does. <laughs> <laughs> like there are times where something will, I'll do something and, or, or, or whatever it is and think, I don't know how that just worked, but it does. And everything's fine and it's stable. And if I drag it into a different scene, everything updates fine. Like, you know, it's a Rube Goldberg machine at, or, or an OK Go video of just little steps that trickle down until it finally, you know, learn Python. Learning Python helps. It's a different, once I figured out all that, you know, the CS50 stuff in Python. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to the procedural thing, it's just a completely fundamental different way of thinking about it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, our engineers frequently uh, point out that schematic is essentially visual programming, you know, and so, it, you know, if you want to kind of learn how to do scripting or learn, you know, really how to how to how to code, um, starting out with the schematic view is actually a good way to start thinking the way that a, 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 a programmer or scripter would think. Okay, and next up, planning. Yeah, plan. <laughs> um, yeah, the huskies. If if anybody's ever tried raising husky dogs, unless you give them a goal or something to do or plenty of exercise, they will find some 
trouble to get into and go completely off track. So when building some assemblies, um, setting boundaries, so what, letting yourself know what what is the task at hand. I got very experimental early on with some of these and went into, um, kind of got off course, had to set it aside and come back and clean things up. But it's a good idea to literally write down in the object oriented thinking, if you if anybody's ever done any coding, that sort of assigning aspects of a thing to itself, like what is a tire, what is um... gotcha. Yeah, wish I wish I had a better word for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Mike appreciates this because he's got two huskies that sort of resemble these color patterns, Ma Mocha and uh, and Maui. And holy schematic. <laughs> so what's this all about? Yeah. Um, at, at, at a certain point, perfection being the enemy of good. Um, it, there's a few of these like jiggle the handle. Ask, um, you know, it'll work. You just got to jiggle the handle a little bit or spending too much time trying to keep a clean graph um, can get in the way of a good project. I honestly just work in workspaces multiple workspaces um, and organize as I go. I'll keep the scene and item list really organized with good folders and try to keep those good, good hierarchies. And there are functions built into the assemblies of just affecting visibility of other objects mm -hmm. so that if you need to find something, you're not searching through a graph, you're searching mm -hmm. through your scene, which is a little different. Um, but yeah, no, I, I I did get some good feedback from Chemo about organizing my graph. Um, so when these become publicly available, I'll make sure they're, they're better than the, than the state that they're in now. And, and that is also, I'll just, you know, uh, I'll say this is something, a problem that we need to solve uh, for users, a better auto organization of, you know, of node graphs. Um, it's not on the slate for next year, but it is is something very heavily on our, on our minds and something the users need. All right. And uh, skeleton geometry. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by this? So, yeah, no, this was another really great edX course that um, got unlisted shortly after I took it. But it was amazing because in the first class or two, um, the guy who was teaching it was talking about a sort of codified approach to the objects and geometry that you're using in your procedural build. And skeleton geometry is essentially geometry that contributes to the final model but does not show up in the final model. It's not that profound, but to have a label on that kind of concept was just hugely helpful to keep everything organized. Like, all right, this is our skeleton geometry. And if you open up any of my assemblies, you'll find a folder that will literally say skeleton geometry and everything that contributes to it in there. Um, separate from, you know, your final output. So it's not it's not wildly profound, but it's uh, maybe it is. Oh, it's a, it's, it's an important it's important helpful. clarification. Yeah, and I never heard it anywhere else. That was the other not nice it. thing about that. And non destructive workflows. Yeah, think of it as a non destructive workflow. Um, if if there's any if you've ever used Photoshop and adjustment layers and being able to just tweak things without destroying your progress and always having a backup, it's uh, that's an that's an important thing to keep in the back of your mind. Cheers. Yeah, no big value. Um, and iteration. Yeah, if you if you need a thousand of a thing, the procedural stuff is the way to go. If you're only building one thing, you probably have a really good reason to be working procedurally if you're doing that because um, it's so time consuming to set up. So you really want to be able to capitalize on that investment down the road. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these these main major structural components that you've made, obviously, they'll pay off later. Um, and uh, there's so many examples of even just 
playing back random arrangements of replicators or, you know, random organizations of carrier geometry for, uh, for replicators, which would be skeleton geometry, like, like you mentioned, but to but like basically experiment with like, how do I like this shape? Scott Robertson did amazing stuff with that years ago, you know, with, uh, designing, uh, suits and stuff like that for characters or, um, designing patterns for shoes with texture bombing and then getting a thousand examples. 10 were okay and then three were passed on to the client but you know being able to iterate like that and then select what you like eh, you know that's that's why people are interested in machine learning these days right you yeah know, but you can do a lot of this stuff uh, just through general proceduralism and moto okay and uh artist friendly and directable that's fine um yeah so yeah the artist friendly and directable thing this is actually from the solar studies uh, in Diva and Grasshopper, but the, the idea extends absolutely into, into Modo and what mm -hmm. it can do, especially with Python and the SDK and everything else, but being able to have your objects respond to other forces um, as you're building an environment for, for games or for anything else, um, seeing a, a, a building respond to erosion patterns mm -hmm. or if, uh, you know, as the angle of the sun changes, being able to change your your shading angles, um, that's a huge benefit. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's that's these are all things that were taken into account by an architect and a designer, right, in the real world to, so that people see what they intended. And so being able to iterate on that in 3D and then have that just manifest in the real world. Gosh, that's valuable. Okay. And, um, that is it for us today, Matt, that was quite a presentation. Um, we need to talk more about, uh, about, you know, using some of, uh, your, your proceduralism in that, um, in that gas station desert scene that we're working on. I think that would be a lot of fun. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. yeah. And thank you so much for walking us through this and showing this to us. These presentations are very challenging, uh, to put together. And so thank you so much for spending the time to, to share this with us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. All right. Well, um, talk to you soon and a uh, great presentation later, Matt. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole just reminded me I'm muted. Um, thanks again, Matt, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, a lot went into that, and you can see there's a lot of interest in the chat uh, about it. So I think you've got a lot of questions to answer, and maybe you have some assemblies to polish up and put up on Gumroad or something like that. So thanks again for that, Matt. And uh, a few last things. This, again, is the last live stream of the year. The next one will be uh, currently planned for January 2020, uh, uh, January 26th, 2024. And that should include, that should involve uh, Matt Mearsbergen to talk about the amazing things that he's been doing with Professor Eggtop. Because uh, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, he's had a great deal of success on YouTube with his YouTube shorts and uh, even became a series as well. And so I can't wait to talk to Matt about that. Um, we are targeting uh, Moto 17.0 for early next year. You know, we're targeting during the first quarter, so we don't want to quite commit to a date yet, but we want to make sure we have a long beta period. And as Mike mentioned early on, uh, the alpha just went out, the most recent public alpha, and we are going to put out a public beta next week before we kind of leave for a break. And the more that you guys can test that over the break, uh, the better that we can fix those bugs. Mike and I will be uh, splitting our time to file and uh, make sure those bugs are accounted for so that we can hit the ground running next year. And I'm very excited for what we, we've kind of set in place for what we're gonna pursue next year. Uh, you guys are gonna see increments of improvement in a lot of different ways. And we have some things that we haven't shared with you yet that we have planned. So there's even more things to look forward to. So have a great holiday. Can't wait to see you guys next year. 2024 is the year of Modo. Have a great holiday. Later. <laughs>